The First Crusade was one of the most spectacular victories of the Middle Ages. By it, Latin Christendom secured control of Jerusalem and much of Palestine, the Holy Land of Christ's life and death on earth. However, despite the victories of the First Crusade, it's clear that early on in the kingdom's existence, travel through Palestine was dangerous. After the great victories of the Crusade, the bulk of the Crusader army returned to Europe with only a small number of knights and soldiers remaining behind to hold the conquests. Indeed, the chronicler Fulcare of Chartres, who himself decided to remain in the New Kingdom, records that only 300 knights and 300 foot soldiers made up the standing forces of Jerusalem in the year 1100. The Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem was centered around the city of Jerusalem as a capital, and over the course of the first decade of the 12th century, came to include an increasing number of coastal cities and inland castles, Pilgrims began to arrive from all over Christendom, intent on visiting the newly Christian conquered holy places, sanctified by Christ's historical presence. However, the roads that brought pilgrims to Jerusalem were infested with highway robbers and Bedouin raiders. The neighboring Saracen kingdoms also presented a danger to Christian travelers. Malcolm Barber, in his definitive work on the Knights Templar, The New Knighthood, quotes a Russian abbot called Daniel who visited Jerusalem in 1106 or 1107. Daniel describes some of the dangers faced by Christian travelers. And there are many springs here. Travelers rest by the water, but with great fear, for it is a deserted place. And nearby is the town of Ashkelon, from which Saracens sally forth and kill travelers on these roads. Daniel also described the perils associated with traveling to the River Jordan. It is a very difficult road and dangerous and waterless, for the hills are high and rocky, and there are many brigands in those fearful hills and valleys. The Knights Templar were founded by secular Latin knights who desired to protect pilgrims like Daniel. Our sources for the earliest days of the Templars are precious and few, but perhaps the most important is William, Archbishop of Tyre, the famous chronicler of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, who served both King Amalric and his son, King Baldwin IV. It's from William's Chronicle that we get those most famous lines describing the birth of the Knights Templar. In this same year, certain pious and God-fearing nobles of knightly rank devoted to the Lord professed the wish to live perpetually in poverty, chastity, and obedience. In the hands of the Patriarch, they vowed themselves to the service of God as regular canons. Foremost and most distinguished among these men were the venerable Hugh of Payen and Godfrey of St. Omer. Since they had neither a church nor a fixed place of abode, the king granted them a temporary dwelling place in his own palace on the north side by the Temple of the Lord. Under certain definite conditions, the canons of the Temple of the Lord also gave them a square belonging to the canons near the same place where the new order might exercise the duties of its religion. Thus does William of Tyre introduce the long history of the Templars, emphasizing the religious nature of their vow. For the Templars were in all ways taking on the role of monastic order, devoting themselves to the ideals of poverty, chastity, and obedience. The king who William describes as sponsoring the Templars was Baldwin II, the third Latin Christian ruler of Jerusalem, after Godfrey of Bouillon and Baldwin I. Baldwin II of Jerusalem ruled the Latin Kingdom from 1118 until 1131. Although William emphasizes the religious nature of the Templars, there is no doubt that from the beginning this group of men was no ordinary brotherhood. Their mission was primarily military, again quoting William of Tyre, that as far as their strength permitted they should keep the roads and highways safe from the menace of robbers and highwaymen with a special regard for the protection of pilgrims. At first their numbers were small, nine men total, including Hugh of Payen and Godfrey of St. Omer. Nor did they at first wear a religious habit, but instead garbed themselves in ordinary clothing. William says that over the course of the first decade of their existence, the number of Templars did not increase, although Malcolm Barber doubts this, as it seems highly unlikely that the church would have endorsed an order of just nine men Nevertheless, the earlier chronicler of the kingdom, Fulcair of Chartres, whose writings end with the year 1127, fails to mention the existence of the Templars at all. So who were these first few men who established the Templars? Who was Hugh of Payen, 
the first to occupy the office of Grand Master of the Temple. Little is known about Hugh's early life, but he appears to have been a member of the court of the Count of Champagne. Hugh was Lord of Payen, a fief attached to the County of Champagne. We have documentary evidence of Hugh witnessing the Count's charters by around 1085, meaning Hugh must have been an adult by then and so could not have been born much later than 1070. He had a wife named Elizabeth, who gave him at least one child. In 1104, the Count of Champagne made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, with Hugh of Payen accompanying him. It was during this pilgrimage that Hugh decided to give up his wealth back home and devote himself to serving Christian pilgrims traveling to the Holy City. And what about Hugh's co-founder, Godfrey of St. Omer? Here, our information is even sketchier but he appears to have traveled to the Holy Land even earlier, during the First Crusade itself. The man who was possibly Godfrey's father, William of St. Omer, had fought during the First Crusade, and if Godfrey was indeed his son, then he likely fought alongside him. Father and son were possibly at the Siege of Jerusalem in 1099. In 1120, at the Council of Nablus, an official assembly of the kingdom's nobility and clergy. The kingdom of Jerusalem recognized the new knightly order. The assembly at Nablus was keenly concerned to define the kingdom's legal code, and the recognition of the Templars fit well into this agenda. King Baldwin II himself presided over the council, and it was here that Hugh of Payen and Godfrey of St. Omer appeared before the king, publicly receiving his blessing and sponsorship. The Templars also received the blessing of the Patriarch of Jerusalem, Varmund, the head of the kingdom's Latin church. Eventually, the Templars would answer to no man but the Pope himself, but at this stage, the King of Jerusalem and the Patriarch of Jerusalem were their acknowledged leaders. The first decade of the Templars' existence was not easy. Despite being sponsored by the King and the church, their resources were limited and they had to make do with whatever gear they received in donation. They wore whatever clothing or armor they received as gifts, and rode whatever horses were given to them as gifts. It's from this period that the Templars take their seal, the image of two knights riding one horse, for it was not uncommon at this time for the Templars to be short of horses. Another early account we have of the Knights Templar comes to us from Orderic Vitalis, a Norman chronicler who tells us that Folk V, Count of Anjou, while on pilgrimage to Jerusalem in the 1120s, actually joined the Knights Templar for a time. Once he returned home, Folk continued to send the Templars an annual contribution. Eventually, Folk would move permanently to the Holy Land to marry the daughter of King Baldwin II and would himself become King of Jerusalem. This early interaction with the Templars is an example of how the order came to be a favorite charity for the nobility of Europe. While traveling through the Holy Land, a nobleman would interact with the Templars, gaining respect for them, and from then on providing them with some sort of sponsorship. Another member of the high nobility who became an early associate of the Templars was Count Hugh of Champagne, a powerful magnate in northeastern France. As mentioned, in 1104, Hugh and a large entourage of his followers traveled on pilgrimage to the Holy Land. One of the Count's traveling companions was another man called Hugh, his vassal and knight, Hugh of Payen. Count Hugh was obviously deeply moved by his vassal Hugh of Payen's decision to remain in the Holy Land and found the Knights Templar. In 1105, Hugh of Champagne returned to his county in Europe. But in 1114, Count Hugh again left his family and lands to voyage to the Holy Land, this time himself joining the Templars. Bishop Ivo of Chartres wrote to Count Hugh, scolding him for abandoning his wife to serve with the Knighthood of Christ. Bishop Ivo's words may have made an impression on the Count, for he was back in Champagne by 1115. But in 1125, Hugh renounced his wealth and titles for good leaving the county of Champagne to his nephew, Theobald. Once more, the former count traveled to Palestine, where he became a permanent member of the Knights Templar, now serving obediently under Hugh of Payen, who had once been his vassal. It's remarkable to imagine a man as rich as the Count of Champagne giving up his position and power to become a poor monk knight but Count Hugh's decision tells us something about the allure of the Templars and their mission, which resonated deeply with the spirituality of Latin Christian Europe. 
In 1126, King Baldwin II of Jerusalem again took the initiative in helping the Templars when he contacted St. Bernard, the famous abbot of Clairvaux. The king explained to the abbot that the brother knights of the temple desired to obtain apostolic confirmation and to have a certain rule of life. In essence, the king was asking Bernard to advocate for the Templars. Baldwin even sent two Templars to advocate for the order in the West. These two Templars, called Andrew and Gondomar, are among the few early Templars whose names are known to us. King Baldwin specially asked Bernard to use his influence to gain the ear of the Pope on behalf of the Templars. Baldwin also made note of the serious danger posed to Jerusalem by the enemies of the faith, that is, the Saracens. Baldwin's reign had been dominated by war with the Saracens, and the king and his army had just won a fantastic victory over the Turks at Azaz in 1125. Baldwin was now hoping to capitalize on his victories by capturing Damascus, thus further securing Jerusalem and weakening the Saracens. Baldwin's diplomatic actions on behalf of the Templars were part of a larger plan to gain more knights for his kingdom and increase Jerusalem's military power in the face of its numerous enemies. No other early patron of the Templars compares with St. Bernard of Clairvaux founder of the Cistercians, and one of the most influential figures of the 12th century. St. Bernard was unreservedly positive in his assessment of the Templars, viewing their mission as deeply spiritually meritorious. In the early 1130s, St. Bernard sent a letter to Hugh of Payen, whom he addressed as, My dearest Hugh, in which he encourages the Templars in their commitment. Go forth confidently then, you knights, and repel the foes of the cross of Christ, with a stalwart heart, know that neither death nor life can separate you from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ, and in every peril repeat, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. What a glory to return in victory from such a battle. How blessed to die there as a martyr. Rejoice, brave athlete, if you live and conquer in the Lord, but glory and exult even more if you die and join your Lord. Bernard's endorsement did much to legitimize the concept of a monastic military order. Traditionally, a monk was a man who renounced the use of violence, but the Templars greatly challenged that notion, living as both monks and knights. St. Bernard insisted that the vocation of the Templars was not only justifiable, but pleasing to God. In particular, Bernard pointed out the sacredness of the task of using military power to defend Jerusalem the holiest relic in Christendom. If it is never permissible for a Christian to strike with the sword, why did the Savior's precursor bid the soldiers to be content with their pay and not rather forbid them to follow this calling? But if it is permitted to all those so destined by God, as indeed the case provided, they have not embraced a higher calling, to whom I ask may it be allowed more rightly than to those whose hands and hearts hold for us Zion, the city of our strength. It was in 1129 that the Knights Templar were officially recognized by the church as a sanctioned order. The Templars were given a rule, as well as distinctive clothing, a white habit, marking them as a group of religious men who had taken monastic vows. Later still, Pope Eugenius III would give the Templars the right to wear the Red Cross, a symbol of martyrdom, and a sign that the Templars were Christ's knights. The Knights Templar were now poised to experience incredible growth. In the coming decades, they would gain substantial properties in the West, and their military presence in the Latin East would grow enormously. Alfonso Henrique was the first king of Portugal. Prior to his reign, Portugal was a county, part of the larger kingdom of Leon Castile. Alfonso's mother, Teresa, had been Countess of Portugal. She was a daughter of Alfonso VI, King of Leon Castile, and conqueror of Toledo. Portugal's origins lay in the great campaigns of Fernando I of Leon Castile, known as Fernando the Great, Alfonso's great grandfather, and the most powerful ruler in the Iberian Peninsula during the mid-11th century. It was Fernando the Great who conquered Coimbra from the Moors during one of the most important early expansions of the Reconquista. In 1128, 
Afonso gained sole control of the county of Portugal. He was a young ruler, and his territory was threatened by the Almoravids, a powerful North African Berber sect that had come to dominate the Moorish regions of Spain, al Andalus. However, Afonso, as a young warrior king, took the fight to his enemy. His campaigning pushed back the Almoravid threat, and by 1139, he defeated them decisively at the Battle of Urique, one of the most important Christian victories of the 12th century Reconquista. I made a full length of video discussing the Battle of Urique, which will be linked below. It was in the aftermath of this battle that Afonso began styling himself King of Portugal. This came in the wake of a struggle with his cousin, King Alfonso VII of Leon Castile, who still wanted Portugal to exist as a subordinate component of his kingdom. Alfonso withdrew his territory from Alfonso VII's overlordship, in part by becoming a vassal to the Pope who recognized him as King of Portugal. It's possible, though, that Alfonso's own knights proclaimed him King of Portugal after his crushing victory over the Almoravids. The Knights Templar, established in Jerusalem in the wake of the First Crusade, very early on attracted the patronage of the rulers of Portugal. Eventually, the Templars would have a presence in all of the Christian kingdoms of Spain, but Portugal was the first to grant them lands. In 1128, Afonso's mother, Teresa, gave the Templars a castle, and once he became count, Afonso too began giving lands to the Templars. The first record of Templar military involvement in Portugal came in 1147, when Templar knights fought alongside King Afonso at the Siege of Santarém. The siege was successful, and Afonso granted part of the conquered territory to the Templars. That same year, the Templars helped Afonso conquer the great city of Lisbon. Afonso rewarded the order with a fortress on the River Tomar, where the Templar master, Gualdim Pais, established a town that became the center of the Templar establishment in Portugal. Afonso's relationship with the Templars was close. He referred to himself as a brother in their fraternity. Essentially, Afonso was an associate of the order. He devoted himself to fostering the Templars and providing them with territory in his kingdom. Meanwhile, the Templars provided spiritual benefits to the king by praying for him and joined him as a brother in his crusade against the Moors. Afonso then became one of Iberia's earliest true crusader kings. His relationship with the Templars is one of the early signs of the association of the Reconquista with the broader Crusades movement. Check out the Real Crusades History store for Crusades and Templar themed t-shirts and other items. Click the link below. The Knights Templar, warrior monks sworn to protect Christendom from its enemies. In the High Middle Ages, the Templars were one of the most powerful organizations in Europe. Yet they began as nine poor brother knights in Jerusalem, dependent on charity and committed to protecting pilgrims traveling through the Holy Land. How did a small, impoverished band transform into an international organization capable of fielding the era's most fearsome fighting force? The answer lies not in raw military strength, but in something far subtler. Eleven ninety, the Kingdom of Portugal, at the head of a tremendous army, Al Mansur, Caliph of the Almohads of North Africa, advances. His target, the frontier castle of Tomar. Tomar is defended by a small force of Knights Templar. Their leader is Gualdim Pais. Despite being greatly outnumbered, the Templars hold out for six days. The Almohads make several assaults on the walls, but each time they are repulsed by the brother knights. Finally, the Almohads breach the fortress gates, but Gualdim leads a counterattack which devastates the Almohad troops. So heavy are Almohad casualties during this attack that from then on, the entrance to Tomar is known as the Gate of Blood. The Almohads are defeated. The Templars have once again shown why they are known as Christendom's greatest warriors. By 1190, the Templars had a major presence, not only in Portugal, 
but all over Christian Europe. Yet their beginnings were humble. In 1099, knights from Christian Europe conquered Jerusalem. They established a kingdom meant to provide safe access for Christian pilgrims visiting the holy sites associated with Christ's life. However, the territory was still dangerous, and the Christian king of Jerusalem had few soldiers at his disposal. To solve this dilemma, a group of nine knights formed a brotherhood sworn to defend Christian pilgrims. Their leader was Hugh of Payenne. These knights renounced wealth and lands back home. They relied upon donations for equipment and horses, and spent their days escorting pilgrims through the dangerous Palestinian countryside. For some years, the Templars remained an obscure organization, but in the 1120s, they attracted the endorsement of St. Bernard of Clairvaux, founder of the Cistercians, and a leading reformer of Benedictine monasticism. Bernard's personal integrity, commitment to reform, and rich spirituality made him perhaps the most influential man of his era. This in itself tells us much about the 12th century, a time when an individual of such authenticity could rise to such prominence. In his famous treatise, In Praise of the New Knighthood, Bernard articulates the mission of the Templars. This is, I say, a new kind of knighthood, and one unknown to the ages gone by. It ceaselessly wages a twofold war, both against flesh and blood, and against a spiritual army of evil. Go forth confidently, then, you knights, and repel the foes of the cross of Christ with a stalwart heart. For Bernard, the Templars combined the highest ideals of the monk and the knight. He recognized great holiness in their mission. Bernard's articulation of this concept of a new knighthood provided the Templars with something indispensable, an ideological framework that resonated deeply with European Christian civilization. Following Bernard's endorsement, the Templars won the esteem of great men and women throughout Christendom. Endowments poured in, and Templar operations flourished. Their knights fought in Spain, Portugal, the Holy Land, and virtually everywhere else that Christians waged crusade. They became the key defenders of the Crusader states, and developed an iron discipline that made them the greatest cavalry warriors of their age. Science fiction writers have long peddled fantasies of the Templars as a secret cult with access to some esoteric power. But the truth is, the root of Templar power was the articulation of an idea by St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Bernard's elegant conception of the Templars' mission proved to be definitive. It won for the Templars the backing of their civilization, gaining them the means to realize a high level of organization and military discipline. The rise of the Templars is a testament to the power of a well-articulated idea. Without St. Bernard's conceptualization, would the Templars have achieved such universal esteem? Monks fighting as knights was a radical concept at the dawn of the 12th century, and yet St. Bernard understood that it answered a powerful need of the age. Indeed, it was the natural child of Pope Urban II's vision of the Crusader, who shuns war for worldly ends and instead wields his sword in God's cause. Bernard's new knighthood not only defined the Templars, it helped shape the burgeoning concept of the Christian knight, fighting not for power, but for love of God and neighbor. If you like this video, check out my novel of the Crusades, Why Does the Heathen Rage? Click the link below.